Captain Midnight. This video is brought to you by Skillshare. Paul Rudd is a very likable guy. I feel like that might be one of the single least controversial things I've ever said on this channel. For decades now, he's brought this innate charm to anything he's worked on, applying it to both traditional heroic leading roles to characters you probably wouldn't like if they were played by almost anyone else. I've covered a decent amount of actors' careers now, and I think one thing that makes Rudd's unique from someone like Robert Pattinson's is that he doesn't have that one role that shot him to mega stardom overnight. There isn't really a twilight in Rudd's filmography. Instead, you see an actor working to hone his craft over the decades, oftentimes not in the spotlight, and finding plenty of success and failure along the way. And that's what I want to cover this week. Rudd has an impressively long IMDb page, so there's just no chance that I can talk about everything, but I think when you take a step back and take it as a whole, a picture really emerges of someone who started out almost purely as a character actor before transitioning into leading man roles slowly but surely over time. And I think that's a really interesting journey to talk about. Well, there's a lot of surprises in the last episode. And it's wow. After majoring in theater at the University of Kansas, his home state, Paul Rudd moved to LA and at the age of 23 landed his first ever TV role in Sisters, a primetime soap opera on NBC that followed the lives and relationship drama of four adult sisters in Illinois. Appealing to a mostly older female audience, Rudd was brought on in season 2 alongside Ashley Judd to inject some more youthful appeal to the show. And apparently it worked, as the show did end up running for six seasons. It's hard to find clips of this performance now, but apparently the industry was impressed, as it led to roles in small films like Jamie's Secret and the short-lived sitcom Wild Oats. It also landed him a role in what was his biggest project to date at that time, as Tommy Doyle in Halloween 6, The Curse of Michael Myers. And I'll be honest, Rudd doesn't exactly make a great impression in the role. Not that he's actively terrible or anything, but it's not exactly the juiciest character. The later Halloween films just don't have that much interest in characters beyond Donald Pleasance's Sam Loomis, and of course, the big guy himself. And they both really outshine him here. Thankfully for Rudd though, that's not the film most 90s viewers would meet him in. See, after Halloween 5 underwhelmed at the box office, the studio got cold feet about the sixth movie, demanding extensive re-edits. That kept the movie on the shelf for a year or two. Meanwhile, Rudd had moved on to a new film, Clueless. Maybe the single best teen comedy of the 90s, and a film loosely based on Jane Austen's Emma. It was an immediate surprise hit upon release, and though Rudd is not the star of the film, he did make a big impression as Josh Lucas, Alicia Silverstone's Radiohead-loving former stepbrother. And I think it's the role where what Rudd is good at really snaps into focus. Because on paper, I'm not sure this character should work all that well. He's really pretentious and more than a little condescending, even if we do often agree with him on how shallow Silverstone's character is being. It's just a character that the audience could easily turn against, but that never happens because of Rudd's performance. He strikes just the right balance between a pretentious college kid who just took his first philosophy class and a really funny, earnest, and likable guy. Audiences ended up loving him, and for good reason. And although the role was far from the massive breakout that, like, Ace Ventura was for Jim Carrey, it definitely put him on the map in a way that Sisters didn't. After Clueless, he would leave that show for good and be off to bigger things. Clueless is a really funny movie, but oddly I think it kicked off the most serious actor phase of Rudd's career. We know him now as a great comedy star, but that wasn't quite the case for most of the 90s. Landing roles in big projects like Romeo plus Juliet where he played Count Paris, updated here to just be Dave Paris, the wealthy romantic rival to Leonardo DiCaprio's Romeo. And he does a pretty great job. Like honestly, there's some competition, but this might be the most underrated performance of his career. I'm not gonna pretend to be like a Shakespeare expert or anything, but I think it's pretty easy to recognize that Paris is one of the most thankless roles in the play, acting as more of an obstacle for our star-crossed lovers than a real fleshed out character on his own. 
But Rudd brings a real humanity to him, giving us a Paris we might not like, but who definitely feels like a person, not a mustache twirling villain. Of course, not every role Rudd was landing during this time was something really notable. For every well-received movie like Romeo plus Juliet or Cider House Rules, there were a few more films like the mostly forgotten The Locust with Vince Vaughn or the poorly reviewed romance The Object of My Affection where he starred opposite Jennifer Aniston. Whether it was as a leading man or in a small bit part though, he was constantly working, and that paid off big. Starting with a low budget comedy that was actually a huge flop upon release, but would go on to change the course of Paul Rudd's career in a major way. Wet Hot American Summer, a bizarre movie satirizing 80s comedies like Porky's, was released in July 2001 to mostly awful reviews and a box office haul of less than $300,000. But in many ways, it was the creation of the Paul Rudd we know today. The movie was saved by home video, where it would go on to attain cult classic status. Directed by underrated comedy legend David Wayne, it helps that the cast of Wet Hot is absolutely packed with people right before they hit it big. People like Amy Poehler, Bradley Cooper, Elizabeth Banks, and Kin Marino. But Rudd probably gives my favorite performance in the movie as Andy, the incredibly shallow and borderline sociopathic cool guy camp counselor. Critics and audiences found the film to be really off-putting back in 2001, and I kind of understand why. It predates things like Tim and Eric, but really embraces a lot of that kind of surreal, absurdist comedy. The movie is happy to throw any sort of narrative logic out the window and almost acts more as a series of connected sketches than its marketing probably led people to believe. Rudd's character is crude dumb, and probably responsible for the death of like three different children in it, but I still find Andy really hard to dislike. The cartoony nature of the story allows him to run wild with improv, and he totally hits it out of the park, giving us some of my favorite comedic line readings in like modern movie history. It's the rare comedy that gets better on rewatches, and Rudd is a big part of why. It was also the film that gave him the comedy world connections that would change his career forever. The wider world may not have taken notice of the movie, but comedy writers and directors like Judd Apatow definitely did. 2002 brought a far bigger profile role for Rudd, but one that he wasn't totally happy with. He was cast as Mike Hannigan in Friends, Phoebe's love interest and eventual husband. That was definitely a big get for any actor. Friends was about as huge of a hit as any scripted show ever. But the role of Mike wasn't really an exciting one. Like he's fine here and he has good chemistry with Lisa Kudrow, but it's just not a character with much going on, like with him usually just getting called upon to react to the rest of the cast's antics rather than getting to do much on his own. In a Zoom conversation with Chris Evans just this year, Rudd said that it was cool to be part of a show that had such a big impact on pop culture, but he felt more like a prop than a real character in it. Apart from Friends, he was still working a lot, but not in anything super notable. Stuff like the okay-ish dramas Two Days and The Shape of Things. His career had enjoyed a bump after Clueless, but it was more just steady work than real movie stardom. That all happened to change the year that Friends wrapped up though. Anchorman The Legend of Ron Burgundy was released in July 2004 and made a respectable 90 million at the box office, before going on to be an absolute monster hit on DVD. Directed by Adam McKay and produced by Judd Apatow, Anchorman actually has a lot in common with Wet Hot American Summer. They're both absurd and at times surreal comedies, with a ton of improv. But Anchorman, having a bigger budget and more well-known stars, was able to package that in a way that wasn't so off-putting to the average moviegoer. Will Ferrell is definitely the lead as Ron himself, but Rudd gets plenty of time to shine as Brian. And like Andy in Wet Hot, Rudd is able to take a character who is just like an objectively terrible human being and turn him into a really likable character. A lot of Anchorman bits have really worn out due to years of people quoting it and a mostly mediocre sequel, but going back to rewatch it, it's easy to see why this thing took off like it did in 2004. The cast is able to balance the absurd comedy with some surprisingly good dramatic moments, and that's something Rudd really excels at. After Anchorman, Rudd was firmly plugged into the Judd Apatow machine, 
which landed him large or even starring roles in things like 40 Year Old Virgin, Knocked Up, and This Is 40. And while I think he's really good in 40 Year Old Virgin, I honestly think this was a case of diminishing returns over time. He's the actual star of This Is 40, but to me, it's just far from his best work. With a bloated running time and a boring story about how hard it is to be a wealthy 40 year old man in Los Angeles, it's probably the least I've ever liked Rudd on screen. Where David Wayne and Adam McKay were able to lean into Rudd's goofy likability in service of creating some really fun and absurd characters, Apatow's movies often cast him as kind of a boring everyman, which he's good at, but it's often not where I like him best. I Love You Man does something similar, but much more effectively, as I think him and Jason Segel just play off each other really well. He'd also work with Wayne a few more times, most notably on Role Models, which honestly might be the first thing I ever saw him in. I don't think he's as great here as he is in like Anchorman, but honestly it's a movie I can go back to over and over again, and it kind of ended up being one of the most underrated studio comedies of the 2000s. 2010 and 2011 brought a pair of starring vehicles that apparently no one but me likes all that much in Our Idiot Brother and Dinner for Schmucks. Our Idiot Brother is, in many ways, a bog-standard indie dramedy, as it follows Rudd's bearded pothead character Ned as he gets out of prison and tries to reconnect with his family, played by other well-known actors like Rashida Jones and Zoe Deschanel. The script and the direction are nothing mind-blowing, but Rudd is giving it his all here. Ned is a great character, this well-meaning, likable guy who keeps putting himself in bad situations. He can be so dumb that I really think the audience would resent him if he wasn't played by Rudd, who really holds this entire movie up on his back. It's nothing mind-blowing, but as an example of what Rudd's charisma can do at its best, I definitely say it's worth a watch. While Dinner for Schmucks is more of a showcase for Steve Carell, Rudd does a great job of playing a Jason Bateman-esque straight man. A guy who has been told by his bosses that he must find one weirdo to bring to dinner so that they can all mock him. It's kind of a lame premise, and the movie is held back by a script that I think could stand to be a little more absurd, but Carell and Rudd are a great comedic pairing, and I'd kind of recommend it just based on that, even if the movie itself doesn't bring much new to the table. Rudd has also made himself the kind of actor you love to see pop up in smaller roles too. Whether it's in Forgetting Sarah Marshall, Veronica Mars, Tim and Eric, or Parks and Recreation, Rudd has just never been an actor afraid to take smaller parts in projects he just wants to be a part of. Even now, as a movie star, it really feels like he's kept that constantly working character actor mentality. But of course, now he's got a major franchise to his name. While I may have criticisms of the films themselves, Paul Rudd was just about the perfect choice for Ant-Man. He can take a premise that's going to be used as a punchline by so many people and make you care anyway. In Civil War, he's able to function well as some reliable comedy relief, but he gets to show off a little bit more range in his own films and in Endgame. While not the most complex character ever, Scott Lang plays into Rudd's skill set so perfectly that it's hard to see anyone else pulling it off quite as well. I think it's fair to say that these are the films that turned him into a bona fide movie star after decades of steady work. Rudd was never Jim Carrey or Will Ferrell, these like era-defining comedy stars, but in some ways that's worked out really well for him. He's an actor that you're pretty much always happy to see pop up in any role, big or small. And even as his body of work grows, Rudd has always felt a little more down to earth than most actors. And whether it's eating hot wings, fighting Spider-Man, or being the romantic rival to DiCaprio in a Shakespearean epic, he's someone who's able to put his signature likable spin on just about anything. He's kind of the anti-Jared Leto. He might not be just a regular old working actor anymore, but he seems to approach every job with that same grounded commitment. One thing I like a lot about Paul Rudd is that he didn't go to some Ivy League university. He grew up and went to college in Kansas and just worked his way up in the industry for a long, long time. If you have similar dreams in the film, TV, or even YouTube world, I think I have something that can help. Video on a budget. Prepare for your shoot without breaking the bank on Skillshare. Whether you're looking to shoot a vlog or even your debut film, 
This class goes in depth with a lot of great lessons on how to make your footage look cinematic without having to spend that big studio money. That's because Skillshare classes are designed to be practical, so you can learn what you need to get working on your dream right away. It's an online learning community with thousands of classes to explore and learn from. So whether it's honing a skill you already have or diving into a totally new one, there's something for you on Skillshare. The first thousand people to use my link in the description will get a free trial of Skillshare's premium membership. So learn something new today and go to skl.sh slash captainmidnight10201 using that link down below. Here's a special tip for the fellows and girls who have not already joined Captain Midnight's new 1940 Flight Patrol. You'd better hurry up and join at once because there's a big adventure ahead. The thing to do now is to get started because we're going to have not only barrels of fun, but loads of free gifts and prizes too.